the airlock's still going absolutely crazy. And so what mm-hmm. you realize is that there's a lot of gas coming off for a very, very long time. Um, and so I think as long as you keep in mind that you're only trying to rouse the yeast back into suspension, uh, you shouldn't have any concerns about that. And, you know, if I'm doing, like, Surly's aging, which is longer, a longer mm-hmm. amount, and this mm-hmm. is on the fine leaves, so I've already racked it off, and now you have the fine leaves, you might do that for a few months. And so, again, I do it very gently. I'm just making the, the leaves just puff off the bottom, and then that's where I will bleed in a little bit of CO2. Even in the carboy, where there's a little tiny bit of headspace, I'll make sure I bleed a little CO2 off of my kegging system, and I just, I just bleed in there just to keep it blanket. I'm really careful about about oxidizing because I've ruined so many good me's that way. And I just, I, I, I'm just, uh, I want lots of oxygen early on in fermentation and then I want to protect it after that's done. Yeah. I know it drives me crazy when, when people either say, well, I, I, I stabilized my mead and, but I still had problems. And we spoke of this a little last week. It's because them not understanding what we went over tonight. They only did a partial, uh, stabilization so to speak and so that's why they had problems they thought that by adding the eighth of a teaspoon to a five gallon mm-hmm. batch the very one and only time that they took care of business and they really didn't and that's then why they had problems later down the road mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i just kind of cringe when people start going to that place well i don't want to add any chemicals and in this and that it uh, and people say, well, you don't really need to do any of this, even with sweet meads. I've never had any problems. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But Grandpa used to make 40 gallons of wine with one five-gram packet of yeast, too, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but just because, you know. Because you were lucky. Yeah, I mean, that only tells me that you haven't been around for very long. And um, yeah. you'll be eating your words at some point, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. So. I have made a lot of bad meat over the years. That's how yeah. I learned how to make good meat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have to make the ones that make a mistake, you know, otherwise. <laughs> and the thing is, even if you learned your lesson and then you, you ignore it, then you'll make the mistake again. I've done that too. Where I made the same mistake mm-hmm. like three times because it was like, I already knew this and I still made this mistake. Yeah, so, been there, done that. <laughs> well, I was just—I yeah. just told somebody the other day on um, Facebook, and they were—they were marveling at Carvin and said he dumped out a meat. And somebody's like, "Carvin dumped out a meat," and we're like, "Dude, you learn the most from the meats you screw up." You know, because mm-hmm. yeah. because that's where the lessons come in. If all your meads were fantastic, you'd never really learn anything, you know, yeah. except how to yeah. drink a lot of mead, exactly. you know. But um, <laughs> and, and, and there's so much uncertainty in our biz because we haven't had the studies. We don't have the depth of lab experiments and university funded blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah that wine has. So we're we're out here shooting in the dark and trying to figure it out. And we got a whole bunch of people arguing about you know, this or that or boil, not boil, um, when to add your nutrients and how much and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. There's was, still an awful lot of stuff you can do on your own in your experimentation just for your own edification so yes. that you can taste the difference, too. Oh, totally, yeah. But Definitely. a lot of people... The boil, no boil is a good one. That's a good one, yeah. Seriously, a lot, a do lot it. Of people, you'll, and you'll, they're different. They are, yeah, but a lot of people are either unwilling or unable for whatever reason. Um, it might be a cost thing or whatever, but yeah, I think one of the things that, that we can really do is push hard for more research into meat making and how to make amazing meat because if we can go, well, if you look at this paper right here, you can see that, you know, instead of having the, the age-old argument of, well, I mean, the self the way back to the very beginning as far as I've been in need and longer and you know and there's still people going well I don't sulfate because blah blah this reason blah blah that reason it's like okay you know because grandpa didn't right I I mean I didn't for a long time but nobody was talking about it nobody was Mm -hmm. doing it so there was no reason to because we didn't know and you know when people started doing it you know I was like oh well then you know this makes sense and And there was a lot of bad stuff being made by grandpa also 
Yep. <laughs> Although I have yeah. to say, my dad made wine when I was a kid. That was kind of what got me interested in it. And he made it in in mm-hmm. in wine bottles with balloons on the necks in the basement in our half unfinished basement. And of course, everybody's everybody's yeah, everybody's, yeah, everybody's with, parents with Concord grape and juice, and it tasted <laughs> like poison. Actually, no, <laughs> my dad wasn't bad. My dad oh, made yeah. pretty good <laughs> wine. I was I, I found a bottle. He made a strawberry rhubarb one. And I found a bottle of it in the basement 25 years later that just got overlooked. And I oh, was wow. rummaging about my dad's a pack rat, so I'm rummaging about in the basement for something or another. And I stumbled across this bottle. And I was like, well, hell, we got to try this. So I took it upstairs thinking it's going to be crappy. I mean, it's 25 years old. It was made in like a in a Chivas bottle, you know, <laughs> which it had a balloon on its neck at one point. I mean, from, mm-hmm. from, from initial ferment to finish, it was in that bottle. And, um, you know, the only thing he did was like take it pour it out of there long enough to get the guck out and then pour it back in again and um and i opened that <laughs> bottle and it was smooth and it was fine oh i was good i was stunned <laughs> mm. my grandpa's stuff sucked <laughs> now, my dad had some talent so i like to think that some of that passed along but um yeah. you know i mean I, i'm sure some of them were awful i didn't i mean most of what he made was all gone when I was still a kid, you know, so I never got to really try any of it. But this one, I was impressed. Now, I don't know how awful it was for the first 25 years. You know? Right, right. Tom, I have a question, if you would. Um, sure. So I've only been making meat for about three years. So my oldest stuff is still relatively young. Um, and I've thought a lot about if I were to want to make some meat, well, you know, you hear people want to make stuff for their kids when they turn 21 or when they get married or something. Um, So I guess it's a two-part question. If, with that in mind, would you do anything different when you're setting up your SO2 situation right prior to bottling is something that you're hoping that you could uh, lay down and and let it age for 20 years? I mean, if if you have 100% containment in a bottle... Do you still have degradation over time, or would it would it there hold its? Be. Yes, there will be some chemical change. So I guess the, if you're going to want to make something that's going to be able to be aged a really long time, like ten years, twenty years, you you have to think of the style that you're going to try to make. Um, and usually, I mean, if you think about think about other types of alcohol, it's usually going to be something that's really high alcohol, like a fortified wine, like a. Mm-hmm. You know, a porch or something like that. So you you might think of a nice big sack mead that mm-hmm. could, that could age that long, um, or tannins can help too. Tannins have right. some antioxidant properties. Um, so something that's going to be barrel aged or something, you know, like a big bold red piment of some kind, um, that'll change over time. You know, it's gonna it'll have some o- oxidation in the bottle, and you know, it'll turn from that bright red over to more of a um, you know, brownish red, and then those tannins, that, that astringency that we get from tannins from a young red wine that's going to be really smoothed out. And, yeah. and you know, the, I think that's, they're delicious. They're just two different wines when you drink a big red. And I've had piments like that, too. Mm-hmm. So, but you're not going to want to do that with a light, fruity, fresh, crisp thing. I, it's, you know, those, those you know, like your little strawberry melomel or mine, I, you know, I need to drink those quickly because they're not going to get better. They might still be good. Right. So I, I think that's what I do. Um, you, you basically are going to want a mead that's going to be able to stand up even even as the sulfites decrease. I mean, they're always going to be there, but they're going to decline over time. Mm-hmm. So it's going to have to be one that, that can tolerate that um, that long-term aging uh, and, and still turn out to be good at the end. So the it sounds like... Be aware of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, me... The other thing to be aware of is that... Um, the tannins and the acids are going to decrease just like the, the sulfites over time. So you, you, you really need to have some experience to sort of guess how much extra yeah, you want yeah. to put in because a wine that you're going to want to age for 5, 10, 20 years is not going to taste drinkable when you lay it down. Right. You've got to, mm. right. you've got to yeah. make it pretty damn horrid and then it ages into something good. Um, so it, exactly, and you got to guess those levels in advance. And the only real way to do that is through the experience, which of course we don't have because we're all young. So, <laughs> well, and you may even—I mean, I have a friend that owned, used to own a liquor store and was uh, heavily involved in distribution. So he had pretty much a carte blanche chance to buy everything under the sun, and he bought you know tons and tons and 
tons of wine to lay down and, and even told me that uh, well over 50% of the stuff that they lay down and anticipate or hope at least that it turns into something good when they finally do open it. He says you'd, you'd cry if you knew how much of that type of wine we've opened up and poured down the sink. So it's really a crapshoot even if you have you know, 100 years in your your family and you've worked at the same winery your entire, you know, background of your entire family. It's still it's still a, a, a crapshoot to some degree, for sure. Well, Ken Schramm was saying at the keynote at the AMMA conference last year that he dumps more mead down the drain every year than a lot of meaderies make all year long. And, yeah. um, you know, if well, Ken Schramm is having to dump meat down the drain, you know that, yeah, it is a crapshoot to some extent. Because mm-hmm. I don't also know. says something about standards, too. Well, yeah, you also that, know yeah. he has ridiculously yeah. high standards. Yeah, Ken's standards are like about an a order of magnitude higher than all the rest of us, I guess. But I don't know. Right. You know, I mean, I'm my own worst critic with my meats. I mean, it, it, so few of them actually ever see the light of day outside my house because I'm thinking, oh, what if somebody thinks that there's something wrong with it? You know, I mean, yeah. I'm I'm terribly, terribly um, sensitive about my meads and whether they'll be good enough. That's why I'm wondering if I can bring myself to enter any next March. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't I, care I if I win or not, to... but I'm just I'm just so afraid that they won't be good enough. You know, <laughs> we yeah. none of us can always make good meads. I mean, even at least as far as from the friends that I talk to, even people that you know make good meads all the time there's still a big difference from a, a good mead versus one that's just happens to be truly what i call magical for some reason it, usually those are intangible reasons um but I, I i would think people should expect to be able to make a mead in in especially um with all the good information that's starting to become available i would i would tell people you should be able to make meads um, that would hot score at least in the high 30s. Um, oh yeah, with within uh, in the high 30s in the yeah from from 35 to 40, you should be making meads that taste that good and would score that good in a competition almost every time you make a mead. Um, and in, if in you don't, then order. you should know. And if you don't, you should know there's something a lot wrong with it. You should be yes, if it's that yes. bad. You should know, um, and, and I've learned more from the meads that uh, that that really didn't score as high because I knew there was something wrong with it. But I and the judges really helped me out over the years when I was first starting out. Mm-hmm. You know, my first Mazer Cup where I sent in some some meads. Uh, every one of those meads I sent in, I had never tasted a mead period in those categories. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I was sending in, st- you know, I still do that. I, I still, you know, I send some in that I uh, are sending in to compete, but I send in some with uh, looking for some feedback or opinions or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. No, and I sent in my very first meet. I sent it into the original Mazer Cup in Michigan that Ken and his buddies were running. And um, I knew it wasn't good enough. Um, even then, even not really knowing anything, um, I still could tell it wasn't right. <laughs> and mm. um, and um, I sent it in because I wanted feedback. I wanted to know what wasn't right and how to fix it because I didn't know at the time. You know, I mean, I had no idea. Now, after oh, 15 years of judging, I've seen a lot of awesome meads and I've seen a lot of really crappy meads and um, <laughs> and everything in between. And and so it, it's it, it's taught me a lot about what makes a good mead. It's also taught me how paranoid I am about letting anybody else taste my mead. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, t- I'm girding myself to bring like a case of what I'm planning on making this winter for to share with everybody at the parties next year. And I'm terrified. <laughs> Just put somebody else's name on the bottles when you take them up there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that one's yeah, terrible. That one, they're good. Yeah, that one's terrible. Oh, Hamish made that one. Yeah. <laughs> Blame the puppies. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I, I want to know how I can get a case of my stuff over there if I come. That's that's my biggest hurdle. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to try to figure that out myself if I can afford to go this year or next year. Well, for you at least you can you can drive it across the border, AJ, and ship it from there if you had to. 
Hamish doesn't it's, have that honestly, option. Honestly, seriously, it's actually easier to just get it on the plane with me. Oh, well, there's that, too. Yeah, you can you could do that, but Hamish, I don't think he can. I don't mm-hmm. know. You might be able to, Ham. Boy, I don't know if shipping's the same coming from Canada into the United States. Um, you won't even want to try to ship a single bottle. I'm not at all complaining, but you know that the Go Firm and the um, Firmado that I sent you, AJ. Yeah. You'd yeah. Be, you'd be amazed at how much I paid for the.